My two sons were reading the file, explains Ria. Maybe they then remembered a conversation we'd had about Argentina. Look at the wording, dead, they said. Loyalty, I think in that World Cup ally McLeod was too loyal. I was the beneficiary, in that he picked me to play against Peru, but he shouldn't have done, wow. That's a sober assessment from Rioc about the calamity in Cordoba 40 years ago. You'd have to say that for honesty, it's exemplary. The quick, easy shorthand of the 1978 World Cup goes like this, Peru should have been watched beforehand, the Scotland players should have ditched the bubble perms, Rioc and Don Masson should have been told, thanks very much for getting us to the finals, guys, but Graham Sooners will take it from here, the 24 times cap Rioc agrees with all this. Well, we don't actually discuss the corkscrew curls of Alan Ruff, Asa Hartford and Seb Stewing on the bench, the thundering goal machine Derek Johnston, but it's a safe bet that Riot didn't approve of the style, given he sported a military standard haircut. He said, my father would send me to the barbers for a short, back and sides. Tell them, same as your dad. Did I want to have long hair like everyone else in the 1970s? Not really, although I did eventually get a pair of sideboards, when the BBC's coverage of the tournament set Scotland's exit to music, the song, inevitably, was Julie Covington warbling Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Soonest, with ringlets he always insisted were natural, appeared on our screens when the lament reached the line, the answer was there all the time. Q mass cursing as the last dredged cans of tartan special were flung across living rooms. They missed the bins, of course they did, it's such a long time ago, says Riak at his home on the Jaggy Cornwall coastline, so jaggy in fact that I'd been told that a rope ladder offered access to the adventurous, although, disappointingly, this turns out not to be the case. In the season leading up to the World Cup I've got to be honest and say I hadn't been playing my best. I was back at Derby County from where I'd won my first caps. Don, Masson, was with me, the Scotland midfield together. It should have worked out well but it didn't. There were fallouts with the Dock manager Tommy Dockerty who'd signed me for Aston Villa as a 21-year-old. But I was a different player at 29, a different man. I had my own opinions by then. As a player, though, you think only of yourself. If you know your club form is bad and yet your international manager is sticking by you, you think, brilliant. As a manager, and I remembered Argentina when I became one, you have to think of the group, and players not performing have to be got out of the team. Would I, in Dali's position, have stuck with me? I don't think so. He was incredibly loyal to me. Loyalty out in the world is important, it's crucial. Football's different. If Ally had picked a midfield of Sunis, Hartford and Archie, Jemal I couldn't have complained. Memories of Argentina have been stirred by this year's 40th anniversary and by Scotland tangling with the dastardly, diagonally striped Peruvians in Tuesday's friendly. In truth, though, they're never very far from the surface and can be revived at a moment's notice, any time the nation has to check itself against overexcitability and daft dreams. Some veterans of the Yale Start campaign regularly put themselves forward for a bout of sadomasochistic nostalgia and indeed Ruffy did this last week. But we haven't heard much down the years from Rioc, the straight-backed skipper who was always going to be dubbed the general of the midfield. In Cornwall, near to Falmouth, the local worthy who'd told me about the rope ladder said Rioc lived quietly and would probably be reluctant to talk, which only made the quest more tantalizing. But talk he does, and his story is a good one. Now 70, Rioc was the Arsenal manager immediately prior to Arsene Wenger's long reign. 
He was the Torquay United manager whose fierce moral conviction caused him to threaten to quit over a proposed blue movie and strippers night to boost club coffers, and then who resigned in shame after leaving one of his players with a broken jaw, giving up football to sell insurance. And he was the Bolton Wanderers manager who Andy Walker rated the best of the striker's career, but only after reversing this snap judgment of his youth. He's never a Scotsman. Walker, a player turned pundit, admitted in a newspaper column his view had been based on Rioc lacking a Scottish accent and not having played for a Scottish club. But I soon found out he was every bit as passionate about Scotland as I was and his knowledge of historical events put me to shame, Walker wrote, Good afternoon, I hope. The sun is shining with you, says Rioc when I call it the appointed time, not a second late, hoping this might endear me to the son of a soldier. I mentioned last clapping eyes on him a decade ago at Easter Road when his opponents have played Hibernian in the Intertoto Cup. Sunshine on Leaf, he exclaims. What a beautiful song. When I heard it sung at the 2016 Scottish Cup final, I thought it was the most incredibly moving moment I'd ever experienced watching a football match. I even phoned up my eldest boy Gregor, pressed the phone to the TV speaker and said, Listen to this, Rioc has hit upon a theme, Smith Johnston, Riley, Turnbull, Ormond, how could I as a boy in England have known about them? Only from reading Charles Buchan's Football Monthly, My Bible, Easter Road is one of the seven Scottish grounds at which Rioc has played, along with 92 in England. He's repeating stats from a recent talk he gave at the local health club where he and his wife Jane are spinning class regulars. He mentions Hybe Alex Cropley, another fine midfielder, like him, born in the garrison town of Aldershot. We've had a laugh about how he's brought Scots whereas, well, I sound like this, Rioc's mother Maggie hailed from Skye and Jim was born in Kenneth Aberdeenshire, where the Scottish crown jewels were hidden from Oliver Cromwell's army. I know all about that and have visited many times. He grew up the second youngest of four boys, the baby of the family, Neil, being a terrific quiz question. He's the first Englishman to have touched the ball in the 1966 World Cup final. Right from kickoff, West Germany's Wolfgang Overath booted it out of play. Neil, who was a ball boy, ran and picked it up, so if Neil calls himself English, what about Bruce? He can't remember thinking about nationality over much while growing up. I've never been tribal, he says. The only team I've ever supported is Cambridge City. Born in England, growing up there, the only country I could have played for was England. Then the rule changed. The dock as Scotland boss selected him but he declined. I won't go into the reasons but can say categorically that I wasn't waiting for England to come calling. His chance came again. I just won the old first division with Orby. Manager, Dave McKay said, how would you like to play for Scotland, I'd be delighted, I said. Good. Ring a Mr. Donald is in duck and he'll tell you where to be. My debut was a friendly against Portugal at Hampton. Walking out of the tunnel I heard a familiar voice, hello mucker, it was my brother Ian. Fancy a bite of my meat pie, the game went well and we won, two weeks later it was Dad Jim's turn to see Rioc sport the dark blue but this was the 5-1 thrashing by England at Wembley. Goalkeeper Stuart Kennedy takes the rap for the defeat but the scorer of Scotland's only goal, from the penalty spot, won't hear of this. We got thumped that day but there's always collective responsibility in football. This is typical Rioc. Ask him about Willie Ormond, his first Scotland manager, and he says, lovely, what a gentleman, McLeod. Different to Willie, very positive, convinced we were going to do well. Did the captain share his galloping conviction? The World Cup could be one? What does a player want a manager to say? That he doesn't think the team can be successful? Footballers are simple creatures, imagine the impact that would have.
And have I not just heard Harry Kane say England can do it in Russia, so what, then, for Jock Stein who after Argentina never picked him for Scotland again? I was disappointed but I accepted his decision. He didn't have to phone and tell me, he was the great jock. If you're looking for dirt to be dished Riyak won't oblige. He's his father's son, displaying the same loyalty. He speaks warmly of Jim, dad and hero, and never grumbled about his peripatetic childhood. I lived in six different barracks and in Germany before I was seven, but no people carrier ever ferried me to school. I got to travel across the parade square in Sherman tanks, Bren gun carriers and five-ton armored trucks. It was a marvelous childhood. Four boys but no one screamed at us in the house. Watching my school games, dad only offered encouragement, he was a top-class athlete, could have thrown the hammer in the 1948 Olympics but for a bout of pleurisy and was bayonet fencing champion in the Royal Tournament 5. Years out of six, now Riak is laughing because he's remembering Jim taking him to see another famous state occasion, the country of his birth versus the land of his father underneath the Twin Towers. Before my first England-Scotland match at Wembley, I was used to the kilt being worn smartly in Dad's regiment and the pipes and drums marching up to Windsor Castle. This was a bit different. I saw a 50-seater bus with more than 100 fans hanging on to the windows, incredible. They had half bottles of whiskey in their sparrings and cans of beer in their tammies. One poor chap accidentally smashed his carry out against the turnstile. His friends pushed him back out of the stadium, no, Jimmy, you need to refuel. As a player Riak would gain revenge for that, 75 Wembley mauling with two successive victories over the old enemy. Depending how the home internationals had gone, the first game back at your club was always interesting. If England had won their players would merely smile. If we'd won we were unbearable, Riak thinks he's always had a scholarly approach to football and it began when everyone else was being tribal. His father, a huge influence, took him to see Stanley Matthews play at Chelsea and they would swap sides at halftime to maintain a close-up view of the great wingman. He'd study the double-winning Tottenham team with his two older brothers. Dave McKay used to run onto the park, boot the ball 50 feet into the air and cushion it on his left calf. I tried to copy him. I saw Uruguayans produce the most amazing dip with their shooting and tried to copy them, the finished article emerging from these studies onto the mud-baked pitches of 1970s England was a progressive midfielder with a cannonball shot. In Derby's title-winning season Riak was top scorer, although his eye for goal didn't mean he could be excused general combat. You were a hard so-and-so, I say. No, I was a dirty so-and-so. It was a very tough era and unfortunately I contributed. I look back and I regret some of the things I did. I don't think this did happen, but I could easily have broken someone's leg. So when I became a manager I never allowed my teams to play that way, as a boss, too, there were times when he went overboard, and incidents like the one with Torquay's Colin Anderson bring more regret, not least because he was lousy at flogging. Insurance for his brother Ian, I could never close the deal. It became easy to label Riak a disciplinarian manager given his military upbringing and stories about him banning players from wearing jeans and fining them for not shaving made good red top fodder. I viewed all that as a slight on my father. It was all too easy to say that as the son of a regimental sergeant major the apple hadn't fallen far from the tree. I was competitive, I was organized, I was a detailed person. 
take care of the detail, Dad used to say, and when you're pacing out every yard for the trooping of the color you have to do that. I wouldn't say I had rules, more guidelines, and we all need them. The organized detailed Rioc learned from Argentina. Already in possession of logs of every day's training since 1971, the manager who brought Dennis Bergkamp to Arsenal but always felt he was minding the shop for Wenger would order a recce in advance of every away game to make sure no hotel was as lousy as the one endured by Scotland in Alta Gracia. So let's close the book on 78, at least until the next anniversary, Riak was injured for the Iran game, and the humiliating draw plunged the team into further despair. We just lost, but Willie Johnston sent home in drugs, disgrace, but that match was horrible to watch. If I'm asked what's the worst movie I've ever seen I always say, Scotland vs Iran, it was a horror show, our man was back for Holland, Scotland needing to win by three goals to qualify for the next phase, and they almost did. I mentioned how Don Masson, dropped in watching from the stand, told me that, at 3-1, he was dreading Scotland scoring a fourth and prolonging what for him had been tournament hell. Riach smiles. That wasn't me. I was on the pitch trying to help us pull off the impossible. I don't think negatively, never have done, and that's down to Dad. I had a great view of Archie Gemmell's wonder goal. Then when Johnny Rep lined up his shot I thought, he's too far out, but he wasn't. We were close, just not close enough. But my first manager, Alex Stock at Luton Town, told me that you should always go out and play with style and a bit of class and I reckon that night we did.